in color. The continuing story of Peyton Place. Starring Dorothy Malone as Constance McKenzie, Ed Nelson as Michael Rossi, Ryan O'Neill as Rodney Harrington, Barbara Parkins as Betty Anderson, Tim O'Connor as Elliot Carson, Christopher Connolly as Norman Harrington, Patricia Morrow as Rita Harrington, James Douglas as Stephen Cord. Last night, Dr. Michael Rossi took Rachel Wells to a state mental hospital near Boston, where he committed her for treatment. A painfully sad and drastic action, but the only solution for Rachel Wells, whose emotional disturbance drove her to kidnap the Elliot Carson baby. The baby was returned unharmed, but the frightening irrationality of Rachel's behavior has left Dr. Rossi deeply depressed. As he returns to his duties as chief of staff of Doctor's Hospital, Dr. Rossi is determined to work himself out of his mood. Good morning, Dr. Rossi. Good morning. How did it go? Smoothly and efficiently. Oh, come on, Mike. What do you want me to say, specifically? Well, is there something you feel I should do for her? I don't know, Stephen. Exactly what does an attorney do for a client who is a uh, patient in a mental hospital? Look, you mentioned you had a classmate who was number two man up there. Did he say how long he thought she'd be confined? No. Really, it's impossible to tell. Excuse me a minute. Miss Choate. Oh, Miss Choate. This is Dr. Rossi. I... I can't understand you. Oh, excuse me. I want to reschedule a staff meeting for this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Yes, Dr. Rossi. And then I'll make my rounds of pediatrics at 5 and at OB at 6. Make sure the residents, all of them, get the word. Yes, sir. Thank you. When you got to the hospital, did Rachel still think she was Ellison? Yes. Look, Stephen, you picked a bad day, really. I'm swamped. No, you're not. Yes, I am. When I came in this morning, I was already two hours behind. You're making work. Making work, eh? That's what I said. You're trying to forget Rachel. I don't blame you, looking at her, listening to her. Yeah, it must have been a very difficult experience for you. Well, forget the sarcasm, Mike. After she was gone, I had time to think about it. I realized how frightening it is when someone doesn't know what's real. Now, couldn't you tell she was having a breakdown? No. Well, you talked to her. Yes, I talked to her. I don't know, maybe I could have helped her. I don't know, I just don't know. Excuse me. Yes? All right, tell him I'll be right down. Yes, sir. Aren't there some signs that show up when a person's about to have a nervous breakdown? Look, I'm not a psychiatrist. Well, say a person is disturbed. Now, there would be recognizable signs, wouldn't there? What are you getting at? I'm just curious. I'm concerned about Mr. Payton. Oh, yeah. I should have known you wouldn't come in here mourning about the past. Well, Stephen, if you're concerned about Mr. Payton, I suggest you talk to Mr. Payton's doctor. Dr. Fielding. Dr. Fielding has been taking very good care of Mr. Payton. But you know Mr. Payton so well, he respects you. Now, Betty and I would both feel a lot better if you resumed taking care of the old man. I've got enough to take care of around here. Mr. Payton is a very stubborn man. I don't have to tell you that. And it takes an equally stubborn friend to force him to do what he must do to go on living. It wouldn't surprise me if Mr. Payton outlived both of us. Yeah, but lately he's behaving so strangely. Take it up with Dr. Fielding. But, Mike... Listen, Stephen, I've already got enough work to take care of around here. But, Mike, you've got to see him. I'm sorry. A game of dominoes. I don't have time for your jokes. You're my employer. I was your employer. 
Don't you back off, bless you hear me. Don't you back off. You're tied to me with a rope a foot thick. You owe me. Do I? What would you rather do, let loose of some money for bail, or let some eager beaver district attorney ask me a lot of questions about us? When you stand trial, all they're going to try to do is convict you for abducting Rachel Wells. <laughs> talk anymore about Rachel. Tried to help her. Tried to protect her. She fell for that. That home, sweet home, talk of the Carsons. Look where it got her. She didn't know and she fell off. Well, now she'll have a long, long time to think about it. When she gets out of that hospital, if she ever gets out, she'll play hard trying to find somebody who care for as much as I did. With a good attorney, you could plead guilty. Get off with just a few years. There'd be no trial. Of course, I could get you a good attorney. I don't want a good attorney. I want to get out of here. I want to go to Mexico, you understand? I wouldn't be a party to putting up bail knowing beforehand you're going to run off. If I don't get out of here, you won't have any, any reputation to worry about anymore. I don't have to put up with your insults. Or your threats. I came here because you wanted to see me. And I was your employer. I felt a normal obligation. Guard! Bail me out, Harrington? I never should have come here. I never should have let myself feel sorry for you. You were right, Mr. Harrington. Now I know you're worried. I was working my way through reform school, ma'am, and I was wondering if you'd like to buy some. <laughs> Come in, Norman. Have you had lunch? Yes, ma'am. And how about a nice cold lemonade? No, thanks. Oh. I'm just cleaning up the living room. Well, I have to get back to school in a few minutes anyway. Uh, sit down. Well, the thing is. Yes? Uh, well, every once in a while I get a great idea, like, uh, you know, once or twice a year. So, well. If you'd like to go ahead and finish cleaning no, up. No, no, that's all right. Oh. Well, here it is. Uh, I was wondering if you'd, if you'd let Rita take care of the baby. Look, it, it, she wouldn't charge you anything, so you couldn't lose there. And she doesn't eat much, and she's gentle. No, I, I don't think so, Norman. Mrs. Carson, you don't want to drag baby Matthew around with you everywhere. You know, you're going to need somebody to mind the store when you're taking care of the baby. You're going to need a babysitter, so why not take Rita? I'm sorry you had to make a trip over here to hear this, but the answer is no. Mrs. Carson, Rita'd be good with a baby. I know she would. She'd be great. I think I'd better get back to my house cleaning, and you have to get back to school. Look, she needs something. She needs to take care of the baby. Do you think around this house we need another young girl? We lost Allison and then Rachel. Isn't that enough for us to bear? And now you want us to take another girl, your wife, into our lives, into our house. Someone we can grow to love and then have her give us nothing but pain and torment. Rita wouldn't do that. She wouldn't hurt you, Mr. Carson, the baby, or anybody. Not now, Norman. Not for a long, long time. Please, Mrs. Carson. What do you think we're made of? No. We can't. And we won't. She's different. Don't you understand? She's different. Rita's not well. What would happen if we left her alone with Matthew and something happened to Rita? Gentlemen, all the way up to the top, second room on the left. Oh, just a minute, young man. Ah, Stephen. Beautiful morning, isn't it? <laughs> ah, 
Oh, Mary, perhaps you should help these gentlemen position things. You lead the way. Hi. Hi. Your grandfather hasn't made an official announcement, but I think we're about to receive his mysterious house guest. He's been standing on that staircase all morning, directing traffic like a field marshal. I think he's rearranged these bouquets at least three times. You know, by the time he gets around to telling us what this is all about, it's going to be hard to act surprised. I don't like surprises, Betty. Not his kind. I think it's kind of romantic. And completely out of character. Would you like some lunch? No, thanks. He hasn't told you she's coming yet? No. Well, I think he intends to say it with flowers. Or shout it. What? All these flowers. They're not for his lady friend, they're for me. Now look, why three dozen bouquets? Why not one? Now don't you see what he's doing? He's running a bluff. He wants to see me blow sky high, worrying about his intentions toward this woman. He wants to watch me explode. Now, he doesn't know I'd sound a fanfare on an A-flat trumpet and let you throw petals on her from the balcony if it would get her into this house. You know, this morning I was worried. I thought it would be too tough to build a case of mental incompetence against him, but look at this. Stephen, aren't you selling him just a little bit short? Not if he continues to make grandstand gestures like this. It'll be a cakewalk. Stephen, I think he's just as shrewd as ever. No. The more he unnerves me by lavishing gifts on this young woman, the more he plays right into my hands. But maybe that's all calculated, too. I mean, he has to be aware of how insane the provisions of the will sound. I don't buy that much. He must know. If you could establish his incompetence, you could make a claim against his estate. So this could all be a setup. Well, it's obvious. The bracelet, the trip to Boston, this, this giddy overdone reception for her. Stephen, he knows we lied to him at the cemetery. Now, he must have made something out of that. No, oh, Betty, it doesn't matter. I don't think if he suspected anything, he'd play into it like this. But either way, I've got him. No matter why he's acting like a fool, he is still acting like a fool, and that's all I need. Oh, uh, Stephen. Stephen, I'm having company this evening. Seven o'clock. Dinner at eight. If you have any other plans, I want you to cancel them. Oh, as a favor to me, of course. Well, I already have. 